Greetings, everyone. I know it's been a few weeks, man. I feel like I'm turning in my homework late or something. Sorry about that. The good news is um, I've been super busy and busy is better than bored. Even better news is this project from the clouds to the underground by the electric shoes is complete and released on all the streaming platforms. So you can check it out to hear what I've been blabbing on about in this vlog series and circle back here to get some insight on how we got there. Uh, the last video we left off with, with was preparing the music for the vocal. Uh, let me catch you guys up on some of the vocal production that took place. The uh, general what, why, how overview. In fact, uh, let's take a quick field trip to the other side of the glass and I'll show you some of the first decisions that we had to make. All right, guys, I'll give you the, uh, the quick uh, two cent tour here. Uh, this is, this is kind of like the jam space or live room here. Uh, nothing super special, quite a bit of a mess right now. It's kind of always a mess because there's always something going on. And uh, we'll head over to the vocal booth. Small room, but super functional. It's um, probably about eight by 12. Um, it's got floating floors, double studded walls, double layer sheet rock with the green goop on there, hung up on the hat channel. Um, some sound absorption, some foamy crap, and uh, you know, a few select microphones. These guys are basically permanent residents here. Um, I have a, the uh, computer screen in here because um, I was doing some ADR stuff last week and uh, it was super helpful to have in here. This here is a uh, like a little personal monitor mixer. Super useful, a little bit more on that later. Let me put this, uh, this camera on a stand and I'll go over a few things in more detail here. Okay, I'm a film crew of one, so bear with me. I'm trying to squeeze all this in in one, one go here. Um, all right, I have several microphones, but there are four that take up a permanent residence in this room. Uh, one being um, the one that is just off the screen here, I'll swing it in, maybe rumble, is the uh, MKH416, that's a Sennheiser microphone. Uh, the next one is the TLM49 by Neumann. Uh, the Manly reference microphone, silver edition, and the Shure SM7B. Uh, I have several more microphones, but those guys just basically live in here. The primary mic that gets used or picked for a track depends on a few things for me. Uh, one, the singer's voice, considering their range, timbre, enunciation, their dynamics, the style of the song itself, like the vibe. Is it a slow ballad? Is it a um, rap metal track? And uh, and lastly, um, how cool does the mic look? You know, does it does it look cool or not? No, I'm just kidding. Um, you know, Warren Hewitt says it best: uh, "Horses for courses." Uh, one thing that's not a factor when picking out a microphone is the price. Not meaning that I'm so rich I can afford, you know, any microphone, which is completely not true. I'm a working man, you know, so <laughs> I have a day job. This is my side gig. Um, what I mean by that is sometimes you buy, you know, like a brand new expensive microphone um, that you got teed up for your project and you're trying to pick, you know, which tools to use for the job, and you just got this $3,000 or $6,000 or whatever price microphone, and you're going to be like, oh, it's going to be sick on this. Uh, it's definitely not true. You, you, need, you need to, like, you know, understand your gear and know its applications um, and how it's going to sound on different sources in different environments and different scenarios. Um, I've seriously used a SM57 on a vocal mic for my buddy Vin, um, when he was doing a vocal cameo on another one of my friends, Franco's, I, I went with the 57 because I wanted the 57 to be lesser than the primary vocal, you know, which, which I did achieve, uh, the desired effect, but I was blown away by like how good that 57, that little $99, $99 guy, like cut that vocal. It just sounded amazing. I'm going to put, I'll have to put that, that, uh, link to that song in the description below because, like, yeah, that Cameo vocal on there is just a $99 microphone. It was nothing special. Like, it wasn't even a crazy preamp get up or anything. In the case of Jim's song, there's no shortage of elements in the song. And I knew I was going to need something with a little extra cut factor. Also, from my previous discussions with Jim, I was anticipating a lot of layers. You know, Jim's voice is very rich in timbre. It never sounds shrill. His style is also very dynamic. And he can push some serious decibels, some serious SPL into the capsule. Also, if you watch Jim, um, he's quite animated and moving about a little bit. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a consideration too. 
Um, so it seems, or at the time, it seemed like there were a few things we were looking for uh, in a microphone when we were trying to make this decision. We knew we wanted one that was a little bit on the brighter side to help cut. Uh, we wanted a, a mic that layers up with itself or other microphones well. Uh, a mic that can provide a good dynamic range, not rolling off too much in the lower volume lines, and one that will complement a louder delivered line as well. And also a mic with a reasonable sweet spot and not like a very narrow polar pattern. So let's go over a couple of these um, and some of the features and the reasons why we picked it. Ultimately, we picked this Manly, right? So uh, it's a tube microphone. It's currently going for like three or $4,000, I think, on Sweetwater. Uh, it's bright. Sometimes it's too bright and it requires a little 5 or 6K cut and some DSing. Uh, what I do like about it is that it has like a 3D sound. I don't know. It's like this three-dimensional vibe um, when the vocals are layered up. Mark Daniel Nelson explains it very well in one of his videos. I'll, uh, I'll throw the link in the description for that too if I can remember. Um, he, he describes it very well. Um, another thing that I like about it is it's, it being a tube mic, it saturates. So when you hit it with a good amount of SPL, it, it tends to saturate and distort ever so slightly, and it's, it's quite pleasing. What I don't like about it is it has an external power supply, and I forget to turn it off every time. Every time I will forget to turn it off. So I went on Amazon and I bought this like cheap little remote switch that I'll turn it off for me after like three hours automatically. I, you know, it was like super cheap. You could control over Wi-Fi. There's programming options, you know, and I use it on things like, like that or things that are just hard to reach. So, I mean, like that's, that's that microphone's only, con. it's not really a con. It's just me like being absent-minded and forgetting to turn it off. This is the, uh, the Neumann TLM 49. It's a solid state microphone, I believe, and I'm not a guru on this. I believe the TLM suffix means that it's transformerless, which implies that it should sound transparent. Yeah, it's not true. It's definitely not a transparent mic. Um, I bought this thing like 20 years ago on a complete whim. It was priced ridiculously low, so I snagged it thinking I could return it if I didn't like it. Well, I liked it because, you know, here it is. Uh, I've heard other ones that are the same make and model. But this one to me is just like extra special. Like none of the other ones of the TLM 49s I've heard sounds like that one. Uh, and, and one way or another, it's on every production I do. It has a smooth top end, fat low mids, an aggressive mid range. It always sounds good. However, that mid range can pile up on you. If you're layering a vocal of several takes or several doubles and harmonies, if you don't switch to a different mic or something, it'll start building up on you and it'll just start banging on your ears. You'll know it. You'll know it. You can't miss it. Oh, man. This thing, the Shure SM7B, this thing, do not, do not underestimate that thing. It is a true workhorse. It sounds great on everything all the time. I don't want to tell you what to do. This video isn't intended to be a sponsor or anything or be a gear shootout by any means, but uh, we will be doing gear shootouts um, in the very near future. But this, the 7B is a mic that every recording engineer and singer should own. First of all, it sounds absolutely great. It's a dynamic mic with great frequency and transient response. It could take loads of SPL. Um, the, the, that mic has won uh, shootouts uh, that I've set on, like with, um, you know, total blind tests, like throwing it, you know, on the vocal without the, the background music on or with it in the mix. It, it has won some ser like very mind blowing shootouts. I'm like, wow. Um, the, the, one of the best parts about it is it's super cheap. I think it's less than like 400 bucks. You know, it's, well, it's cheap for, you know, studio microphone. Next guy up is this guy here. The, uh, I don't know if he's in the frame, is the MKH416. Um, I think it's like one of the most underutilized mic in the recording studio ever. Uh, I haven't owned this exact one for very long, so maybe I'm in a honeymoon phase with it. Um, I have, however, rented it several times for film productions. Yeah, uh, it's the mic that goes on the end of the pole thingy. Um, and sometimes I'm the guy that holds the pole thing. It's called the uh, boom mic or a boom. And that's often referred to as a, a shotgun microphone. Um, it has a very familiar like movie contour to it. Um, it's absolutely fantastic for recording vocals sometimes. It has an amazing off axis rejection and a very smooth mid range. Uh, vocals are very intelligible, even in rough scenarios that are, you know, very noisy or, or busy mixes. Um, the off access rejection is just ridiculous. It's kind of a con too, because it means that the microphone is extreme, extremely directional. So, you know, if you 
Uh, if you don't have it pointed directly at the source, it's it's going to sound a little wonky or it's actually just going to disappear. I mean, I'm not sure if I'm going to use the audio from this mic because I just kind of threw it up here on a whim. But, uh, you know, if I am, I'll include it in the video. This is me in front of it. This is me off to the side of it, in front of it, off to the side of it, off to the side, coming back, coming back, coming back, coming back. Yeah, it's, it's pretty wild. Um, I've been uh, experimenting with using it on like some random sources like acoustic guitars and percussion. Uh, pretty good results. So I'm very curious to see where that's going to go. Um, so getting back to Jim's thing, um, when I was listening to Jim's roughs, you know, like actually like over all the time, like over the years, I've always noticed he had a plentiful amount of distortion on his voice. I think this is in part because um, he liked the sound of it. And I think it's also because it was his way of controlling the dynamics because he wasn't very familiar with like compression techniques until, you know, very recently. I wanted to include a touch that distortion vibe in this production. So it's a contributing factor for microphone selection. All things considered, you know, like I said, we went with the Manly. I thought it would have the most complimentary features for the song, having like the top end with a little bit of extra cut on it, the tube circuit to provide some saturation on some of the, lo on some of the louder passages. And, um, you know, I wanted to go for that 3D thing on the layered vocals. We did do a brief shootout at the top of the very first record, uh, vocal recording session with the TLM 49 and the Manly. And it was like, it was kind of splitting hairs a little bit. Um, Jim kind of favored the Manly. So I was like, yeah, all right, no problem. We're going to go with the Manly. That was it. I do want to talk briefly about the monitoring system because um, it's, it's very important to, you know, get that right. Um, the monitoring system services uh, functions like TalkBack. Um, in the monitoring of buses or tracks, uh, the, the talent can adjust it to their own liking. Uh, the units are powered over Ethernet. The main unit, or the brain, if you will, can be fed up to eight mono cues from buses or tracks uh, from the interfaces via either analog connectors or ADAT cable. Uh, the brain can then power up to, I think, 16 of these personal little monitor mixers, and the eight cues come up on the little knobs here. Um, channels three through eight can be linked for stereo sources. One and two is stereo by default, although there is a mod that can be done to split the one and two between the one and two knob and the limiting, foregoing the limiting functionality. Um, typically, I'll assign drums to one and two, guitars and bass to three and four, vocals and effects to five and six, the click to number seven, and the talk back to number eight. Sometimes I think is what I did do with Jim in this case is I'll simplify it so that like the music just comes up on one and two and the vocals are on three and four and I'll leave the click on seven and the talk back on eight. And what happens is if he wants to jump over to harms or a double or something, I could throw that up on five and six. The idea is to give control to the artist. You know, I'll, I'll show you what the bus routing looks like in the DAW, um, but it's it's super important to somehow you know provide you know crystal clear communication between the control room and the vocal booth and then you want the artist to you know feel comfortable to hear everything well um if you know if it's you know they're not hearing it right in their head they're, they're not going to get it right in the microphone now that we have a microphone selected the next thing for consideration is a microphone preamp just like microphones microphone preamps have certain sonic characteristics some of those characteristics would be described as uh, maybe clean and transparent um or punchy or you know fat or dirty um or loads of character uh, i have several of them here to pick from i'll just go through them real quick and kind of give you my experience my brief description on them um it's really funny because everybody has their own way of you know uh conveying what they think these things sound like um for 500 series i have the uh, API 512C. It's like super transient, fast, and punchy. It's like awesome on kick and snare. Um, the Neve 1073 LB, um, which is loads of character. Um, it distorts in a pleasing way. I, it's definitely my go-to. I love that guy. Um, the uh, Heritage Audio 73 Junior, which is very much like the Neve one, except it's just not as extreme. It's the same kind of sound, just not as much, um, which is sometimes just perfect. For the tabletop stuff, I have a Universal Audio Solo 610. That's a tube mic pre. It's got that tubey vibe thing. It pairs really nicely with that um, Neumann TLM 49. Uh, going into the rack stuff, uh, I have the Avalon 737, which is great because it has a compressor built in and a really beautiful EQ. The top end shelf on it is just amazing. It's like glass. Um, 
I think it's it, it, it can be very serviceable for a vocal, but my preference for it is to use it on bass. Um, in addition to that, I have the Focusrite ISA 2A, which is mostly transparent, but can get a little gritty if you push it real hard, and it has a real mid-forward range to it. I really like it on guitars and you know maybe like um, drums, especially snare drum. Uh, the Universal Audio 4710Ds is an interesting unit because it, it has a solid state circuit and a tube circuit, and they give you a knob where you can, you know, bounce between the two or blend the two together. Also, each channel has a uh, 1176 style compressor built into it, so that's that's uh, very useful. Um, in addition to that, we have the Universal Audio 8110s, which are my go-to uh, drum guys. I just they're basically normal to my my drum snake. Since Jim likes a fair amount of grit on his vocals, and I love it so much, we went with the Neve 1073 here. Um, let's uh, let's patch that in and get this all wired up. I swear that we're too strong to fall apart. No. I'm gonna go through this super quick because um, everybody's scenario is gonna be different. So now that we have a signal chain configured. Um, I'm going to use the patch bay. Patch bay is a great way to have all your gear come up to one single interface so you could plug anything into anything super quick um, without reaching behind a bunch of gear or stuffing your arm down a hole or pulling anything out of the rack. I'm going to go through it super quick. Um, like You really don't have to understand it completely, but I figure some of you guys might know what's going on. You might want to see what's happening. That manly microphone over there is plugged into the snake on channel 10, which for me that comes up on this patch bay, patch bay 216. Um, and let me just stop for a second. Generally speaking, uh, patch bays are configured to have the inputs on the bottom and the outputs along the top. Um, there are some exceptions. You could do whatever you want. I have an exception here where the, um, just simply because I ran out of patch points, uh, my Neve 1073 uh, input is on 22. Um, of patch three and the output of it is on 21 of patch three and if i want to now i could go directly to the interface and i'll do you know seven if i wanted to intercept the that and do a distressor you know i could easily um, come into the distressor then out that same distressor and then into the interface again um, i'm not doing that in this case i decided not to compress on the way in i usually do but in this particular scenario i decided not to so the configuration we used for this recording session was just mic, preamp, interface, and we set up a, um, a distressor on uh, a monitoring path. Um, and I'll show you how I did that after. We do have one last order of business here uh, at the patch bay, which is super important. We want to set up a talkback mic um, so that we can route that through the DAW and Jim can hear me through the headphones and everything. Um, I have a dedicated talkback line set up right here. And I'm just going to patch that into number eight. So in the DAW, we'll probably see that come in on number eight. Okay, now that everything's all patched in, there's a couple things I like to do to prepare the session for the vocalist. Uh, one of those things is just make a quick stereo print of the song, kind of get everything roughly balanced or pretty well balanced, and just make a stereo track and then disable all the other tracks. Uh, it helps you do a couple things. One, you won't be fiddling around with the kick and snare or other you know, volume stuff that you just don't need to be doing because you should be focusing on the vocal at this point. Uh, the other perk is you can now allocate all your machine's resources uh, for the task at hand. So you can lower the buffer size without your virtual instruments, interrupting playback and such like that. So I'll, in the DAW, I'll go to the setup. I'll check out the playback. I'll bump it down to the lowest setting, 64, because i got so many ins and outs. And I will open the actual session that I did the tracking in um, but I'll, for now, I'll just show you how to set it up from scratch. I'll just create a junk session. Uh, if you have like an IO template or IO settings you want to use, you can load that up at this point. For me, I'm just going to use my previously configured. And so, like I said, you probably at this point would have a bunch of tracks already. For example, you might have like, you know, who knows, 20, 50, 100, two, three tracks making up your production. And what we want to do is we want to, you know, kind of balance all your stuff out and get it sounded pretty good, and then bounce your bounce your uh, your mix bus, and that's going to bounce that, you know, down to a stereo, you know, just for example, that's going to be your rough mix, whatever. Boom, and that lands there. And then what you could do with all these guys is you can move them all to a folder, just call it band, and then you can just tidy up that folder, and then you can 
make it inactive. You can hide it and make it inactive. Because all you need right now is this guy and then several vocal tracks for your vocalist to work on. So let's set those up. So I like to start with like, you know, four, eight, or 12 vocal tracks. I'll start with eight. I'll just call that Vox. And then Pro Tools will automatically number those. The next thing I like to do is set up a uh, bus for those to go to, a stereo bus, stereo aux track. And those will be all the vocals. We'll call that boxes. So everything will land there. Uh, there's a couple ways to skin that cat. You can create that track and then send it to a bus, then set that in, that bus's input to that bus or that aux's input to that bus. Or alternatively, if you didn't want to do it that way, you could uh, select all these guys. I just realized that I actually didn't want that to go there. Boop. You can select all your vocal tracks and you could say new track and then you can name your track and then Pro Tools will assign it that bus, that name right there. So stereo, aux, voxes, create. And you'll see that it created that bus, voxes, called it one because it just created a second one. Either way, they're all ending up right here. The next thing I like to do is I like to create a talkback mic because I patched in a talkback. So we need communication with the singer. So we'll go ahead and make a mono aux track, call that talkback and aux right there. And then just kind of a weird thing with me. I like that track always to be yellow. And what we're going to do is we're going to mute that straight away, set it to the input that we set it on, which I think was uh, ch -ch 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 number eight. Yeah, eight, eight. Oh, there I am right there. And that's why I muted it, because I would have instantly started coming through the, the um, speakers. All these guys are coming up that manly mic, which is on A7 from the patch bay. So here we go. That's interface A7. So now these guys are all ready to rock. They're all armed up. Um, there is one slight curveball I like to do, because sometimes I'll patch in a distressor or a compressor on the way in. Other times I don't feel super comfortable committing to that compression on the way in. Um, I think in this case with Jim's, I did not put the compressor right in the single chain. I did, however, reconfigure this slightly. So I put this curveball in here. What I did is all these tracks that I'll be recording, um, the, like the lead vocal track is I made a new mono aux track and uh, I put my distressor here and I just did this. And what I did was instead of all these going straight to that vocals bus, I'll just go to a open bus, bus three, bus three in here, and then I'll put this to that Vox's track. So what's happening here is all these tracks are mono vocal tracks that will record one at a time. They'll pass through this bus right here, which I'm gonna load my uh, distressor, which is normal on my patch bay, so it doesn't require me to do anything else. And then this is gonna pass signal here. So just for example, I'll, uh, I'll show you the signal chain. We'll just load up a, um, yeah, we'll just load up a signal generator over here. And we can see now that the signal is passing down the channel out to bus three, which is coming up here. And then that's hitting the distressor and the distressor is returning it to this same fader, meaning that the distressor isn't, you know, affecting the way that the vocal is recorded. And then it's coming up on this, uh, vocal, all vocals or vocal channel. Uh, stereo channel. Let's get rid of this. What are some of the benefits of this? So the benefit of this is we don't have to keep sending to the monitors for this. Um, the monitors on the hearback system are uh, set up for, let's see, I'll put, yep, hearback. I usually put the vocal on three and four because it's the top left corner knob. And <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll send this pre-fader because that means we can adjust this volume independently of the performer's volume. So, you know, if, uh, if Jim has his, you know, wants to crank it, he could crank it in his headphones or whatever. If I want to turn him down or bring him way up while he's tracking so I can really study what's going on, I could do that. So now for the rough mix too here, what we need to do is we need to send him the rough mix. And we're going to do the same thing. It's going to send it, I'm going to send that to uh, one and two, which is the bottom left. And We'll send that pre-fader. That way I can actually mute this. Let's make this a different color. I can actually mute this track while he's singing and just hear the vocal, but he'll continue to hear the uh he'll continue to hear the track. Uh, another common thing to do is I'll do the click track on the monitor number seven. And I definitely don't like hearing the click track all the time, so I'll pre-fader this and mute it. Did I make this pre-fader? Yes, I did. Let's put it down there so everything is in the same spot. 
Uh, and then my talk back, I send on channel eight. So I'll output here back number eight. And this is definitely pre-fader because we don't want to hear it in here. It'll just feed back pre-fader. Boom. Another couple things I'd do is uh, maybe set up a couple of reverbs. So we could, you know, just say we wanted a reverb on all these. I guess what we could have done is just created one and then duplicated it. But I, I like the naming convention, uh, you know, the way Pro Tools automatically names us one through eight. It's just way easier for me. But uh, if we wanted to do a new send to a new, uh, like, reverb, maybe, maybe we'll do, like, VX verb. Great. And there's a reverb. And then we can return this reverb to the same vocals uh, bus so that he hears it while he's tracking. Get some reverb in there. We just maybe, you know, dial each one of these into taste as we're going along. Maybe this one's the chorus. I want to juice it up a little bit more. I don't like to use anything crazy for this. It's just something real generic. Uh, it's generic and also sounds super good. It's just that D verb like this. Yeah, any one of these settings will do for now. Good. And maybe you might also want to do like a similar thing with like a generic delay, which you can do very, you know, very same thing. New track, we'll just call that VX DLY. There they all go. And we'll just slide this over here. So now each one of these tracks has a, uh, a vocal reverb and delay send to these auxes. And I'll also return this delay to that same vocal bus. So these, uh, this reverb and delay here both end up right here. I guess we can make these a different color. Boop. And that's how that plays out. So we have our rough mix. Jim can hear it on channels one and two, pre-fader, independent of what I do with it here. We have eight vocal tracks queued up, ready to go, each with a little reverb and delay send, all of which pass through this mono uh, aux channel. It just has a distressor on it to give them a little bit of a squeeze. And that passes onto the Vox bus, or you know what, maybe I'll make it more clear for you guys if I call it all, all vocals, because everything and anything is vocals is going right there right now. And like I said, those reverbs and delays are also parked right there. We have the talkback that you can see bouncing around here that doesn't blast through the speakers because we have it pre-faded, pre-fader, send, and muted. Um, and the click, if he needs it, will always be bopping up channel seven and we don't need to hear it. So we have it pre-fader and muted. That's basically it. That's how, that's how this goes. And I'll show you now exactly what that looked like for him a couple weeks ago here. All right, so what we have here is one of the vocal tracking sessions that was early on in our production. Every time I do a new day, I just save it as a new file. So I just called up one of the older ones. Uh, you can see it's very similar to the layout that I described before. We can see that we have the band, all the band tracks here that are frozen and consolidated in this folder. And this uh, track here that says print, I'll label it for you guys. That's the rough mix. So the, the, whole, the whole shebang is coming up right here. And that's got a send to the monitors. That's pre-fader. So I can, you know, change the volume of the music uh, while Jim's tracking and it doesn't change the volume in his headphones. Um, I mentioned uh, earlier that we did a quick shootout um, between uh, the TLM 49 and the Manly. There's that right there. I don't want to get into that. This isn't a comparison video for that. We have, I don't know, six, eight vocal tracks here that are all being sent to this C-Vox track. It's just a mono audio, uh, aux track with the distressor on it. And instead of, you know, sending to reverbs and delays independently off each one of these, all these are just kind of intended to be the lead vocal track. So it's just kind of sparsed out to be organized in a way that kind of fit our workflow. And off that track, I have some sends to some effects, um, most of which I hate because it's just not necessary uh, for our discussion just yet. But you can see the familiar uh, VX verb, VX delay, which goes to the verb and delay, aux channels respectively. All of which, the vocal, the reverb and the delay, and the other effects, uh, end up at the all vox track, which has the monitoring on it that is pre-fader so that I can mute or change this volume independently from what Jim hears in the headphones. Okay, I think that's about it. Also, I have like a um, you know, a room correction thing on the, on the monitoring bus for me. If that's something that you use, you want to make sure you got that in there. If I flip over here to the edit window, you can see our linear workflow. Uh, that's intentional. We sparse out the song in segments. Uh, it makes everything easy to work on. And Jim has a lot of different um, alternate 
harmonies and melodies and lyrics that he likes to try out. So we'll try out all of the different versions. And when he feels like he's got uh, what he wants in the basket, and I feel like we have the takes that we need to do it, we'll uh, we'll move on to the next part. After we can kind of get all the parts down, we'll go back and we'll flip through and we'll take all the best snip, like all the best tidbits from uh, each take, and uh, and then we'll compile them in the one take. And it's it's pretty easy to do, and just put a little crossfade between them, and it's you know it's just like one performance. Here you go. Check it out. So then once we get all the lead tracks in, in the versions that we want and they're comp compiled in the way that we want, we'll circle back and we'll do a little, little editing. So, you know, I'll show you if I fire up uh, the inserts a &E. We don't go nuts with like auto tuning and slamming stuff out. We'll, you know, bring Melodyne in and we'll just, you know, gently touch some stuff up as, you know, as we feel like we should we try to be super tasteful with this. Uh, one note that I'd like to point out is like, whenever I'm working with this, I just really, I never use this modulation tool on like guys that are actually good singers because um, it just, that's this, this one is the one that like makes yeah. the T-Pain thing. It's the kind of the giveaway. So it's not what you want. This pitch drift yeah. tool, however, is very subtle and you can just yeah. gently, you know, job, you know, nudge notes up and down. I will say like Jim is nearly perfect. And uh, if he was the only guy I recorded, I probably wouldn't even bother spending money on this. Yeah, so I mean, this is like a wash, rinse, wax, repeat process. Um, we go through, do all the lead vocals, and we'll circle back, do the same thing with the backing vocals. We'll park it, we'll take a listen to it. I'll send Jim a rough mix. He comes back with some comments. Sometimes we'll come back and touch a couple things up with Melody, maybe, or more likely, we'll just kind of redo it and take some additional takes. Um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump into the actual session. I'm going to solo out these vocals and show you guys what we ended up with. All right, so here we are. This is one of the final versions of the song. I say one of the final versions because there's a film cut, a full-length cut, there's an Atmos cut. Uh, this happens to be the film cut. I'm just going to play it for, me, for you from like the top of the verse. And what I'll do is I'll periodically solo the vocal and drop the solo out so you can hear it uh the vocal production soloed and then in context of the song here we go check it out i've been waiting on you for countless dates on end and mark she gave me that's true but i swear that you wear one too oh love you is by courage to create a better side of me I swear that we're too strong to fall apart Like give away the whole song it's on spotify you can listen to the whole thing and it's full, full glory if you want to um there isn't a lot of any one thing going on there's just like a bunch of little things going on um for example the uh the doubling kind of effect comes from like three different kind of things so one of those things is an actual double and in addition to that there is this uh h3000 kind of thing that's a micro pitch or micro shift. It's a very popular doubler sound. It's not like the heaviest one that's going on. There's there's like three of them. They're all just kind of subtly doing their thing along with a real double track. So that was one of them. The second second doubler kind of thing going on is the um, is I call or Warren Hewer actually dubbed it the hugs. I think he calls it like a hug trick or something. Or he says it hugs the vocal, which is super true. All it is is several of these um, you know uh, waves pitch shifters that um are basically ever so slightly different so each one is a slightly different uh tuning and slightly different delay time i use like six of them and you kind of scramble them up so that you know they're not all flat on one side or all you know sharp on the other side you kind of got to mix them up and balance them around 
That's the second of the doubling effects. The third one is pretty cool. I liked it a lot. It's actually an H90. It's like a guitar pedal. It's also made by Eventide, and I believe it's like the same algorithm as the H3000. It's just that coming off the pedal, it actually it sounds really cool. I'll solo it for you. Check it out. I've been waiting on you for countless dates on end. It's like, like fat and creamy sound, and I really like it a lot. Uh, aside from that, there's nothing super special going on. There's the original uh, D-Verb reverb that was from the tracking session that got stuck on there. A uh, Echo Boy Jr. And then several of these little like one-time throw uh, dirty delays that uh, come in and out periodically. Aside from that, that 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 is it. That's the vocal production. After all the vocal tracking was done, there was a little bit of room for some enhancement. Uh, when we were doing the initial production and arrangement of the song, we didn't want to clog it up with a million instruments and sounds. We wanted to leave the arrangement pretty much wide open so that we had free reign with the vocal. We did pass through and add up some, add some stuff in, some guitar parts, um, some auxiliary synths, and just to kind of you know fatten and widen out the mix. Um, let me see if I can find. There is a good uh, kind of a guitar chimey thing. Yeah, yeah, right there at that spot. Check this thing out. It's very cool. Without it, it just it, it feels empty. Again, that's that's nothing super special. It's just like a Les Paul Jr. on one side, I think a Stratocaster. On the other side, like a Marshall amp and, you know, a little bit of chorus and delay. Nothing super special, but that that was that's kind of the point. It's all these little subtle things. If you take that passage out of there, it kind of sounds boring. Now with it. It's subtle. You know, like I said, it, it's it's like a million little things all over the place. That's just one example. There are literally millions of them. I think is the case like with everything. It's not ever just one thing that makes something sounds cool or, or to me or that like checks a box for me. It's like all these little things that are just perfectly placed. That's a wrap for this production. The Stereo Master is available on all the streaming platforms. I'm pretty happy with the way it came out. Pretty sure Jim is happy with the way it came out. I did do an Atmos mix for this, um, but probably going to release it along with the final cut of the feature film of the same title, From the Clouds to the Underground. I will be doing a, a video on the Atmos production process for this because I did it on a Windows machine this time, whereas I usually do it on a Mac computer. I'm more of a Windows guy, but I usually do the Atmos mixes on an Apple computer. I got to say... On the Windows machine, it was kind of a nightmare. There were a lot of hoops to jump through. Fundamentally, it was the same concept, but technically, to get it up and running and set up and to accommodate my workflow, it was just a real chore. Um, but I'm sure some of you are working on Windows machines, and you might want to see how you could pull it off. More on that later. Find my way home.